Let me now invite uh, the speaker here uh, who will join me on stage, Oliver Baker, <coughs> a man whom I would qualify as a, a man for all seasons. Uh, he has the courage, he's an old man, the courage to say what he thinks. And uh, he said in an interview recently uh, for a German newspaper, he said, I have a lot to do. And I particularly like that, Oliver, because when you listen to all the sad stories, you know, people have difficulties to be optimistic in this time. And I think it's very important if you want to resolve the problem, you need to have an optimistic approach. You're leading an international insurance and asset management firm of ladies and gentlemen, 142,000 employees in more than 70 countries. And that is clearly an important and difficult task, but in addition to that, and I, as an academic, I'm very pleased to uh, report that Oliver still finds the time to also teach young people. And I think that is important because the future is with the education of the young. Oliver, we are going to cover a number of questions, uh, uh, and we would start uh, with a little bit about the expectation and understanding of insurers' role in society. And the first question for you, um, you have been saying that you believe that a lack of growth is a key challenge for society. Um, how can Europe support growth? And in your view, what is growth? Very good. But first, before I answer your question, thank you for being here. Thank you to our hosts for having me here. It's a real pleasure. And thank you to our local colleagues. We have a very fine company here, and they're doing a great job. So let me say that first. Now, to your question, by the way, we're growing here very much, and it tells you a little bit what the underlying problem is. It's a problem of mindset. Uh, because growth typically only talks about what do the revenues do, where does that come from. And Albert Einstein once said, if you get up every morning and you do the same thing over and over again, and you get up the next morning and you think something will change, then you're mad. And I think it's very important what Andreas just said, in order to do um, what we need to do to grow our industry, we need to change quite a few things. And then the growth will come, because society will honor better services and better products. The real issue that we have today, and I'll give you many examples, that our industry is not at the forefront of interest of our societies and it's not at the forefront of respect of our societies. You know, when I have two kids, they're 20 and 19, they go at, um, the, to a list of what are the most fashionable jobs to work in, insurance typically shows up second to last. And uh, just before investment bankers. <laughs> yeah, so this is a reason we laugh about it, but it's a real issue. Uh, that we have to confront. And when we are amongst ourselves, we typically like to congratulate ourselves on how great we are. And so the first thing is we have to add more value to society. We can talk about how we do that. Yes, exactly. Uh, if you, your children have a view about insurance, uh, how do you then explain to them what insurance is and what are the positive values? Yeah, they typically say, can you say it please in five minutes, not in five hours, so we actually get it. It starts with that. Yeah, our industry is very complicated, and if you need to explain something over five hours that should add value to society, you already have a charge. So the, the one thing we do that in that sense is we need to be dramatically more simple in communicating the value that we, that we deliver, and that gets you to a number of things. But at the end of the conversation, I think they're pretty proud of what we do. But it's not self-evident. Uh, you know, Andreas gave you a few numbers earlier on what we do every day. It's not at the forefront of industry, and uh, we have a few challenges. So, he, for example, it starts with a very simple question that is very relevant <coughs> to the times that we go through is, are we trusted by our communities? So when you do surveys of our clients and of various institutions, and do they say, do you trust the insurance industry? You can say we're better than the banks, but that doesn't cut it really. I don't think that would work. <laughs> what is the, you know, what can we do to make uh, insurance more attractive to consumers and particularly to the regulators, to the politicians? Yeah. So I start with an anecdote. About 25 years ago, I traveled to Scandinavia on vacation, and I saw a report that showed the customer satisfaction that uh, Scandinavian insurers have relative to other industry. And I was flabbergasted by the fact that it's very, very high. It's very, very, I don't know whether you know that, it's typically not what we look at. When we measure our industry, we look at revenues, we look at profits, we look at assets under management, we talk about that. 
But the first and the foremost number that we uh, now need to look at is how happy are the clients with the products we provide to them. So I went in, and, and there are many, many uh, aspects that I can talk about why this industry going through a crisis at the end of the 90s, they took that, by the way, as a, as a wake-up call. They have totally changed the way they, they operate with their clients. Right? So we dream in Allianz of uh, things that in the Scandinavian insurers, the better ones have, which is first call resolution of 80%. In Allianz, that's about 25, just to give you a number. So I might be overly simple, but I'm trying to do that given your question. The first and foremost question is, what do we do that our clients say, you know, working with our industry is a pleasure? <laughs> well, what is a pleasure for the consumer? How would you define the, you know, if you are, you're also a consumer, now what would you expect as a consumer in to, to do better and do it today? First and foremost, our products have to become a lot more simple. Ah, I, I like that. I like yeah, that. A, lot more simple. Simple. a lot more simple. It, it, I think it's absolutely possible. I can give you many examples um, from our own company and how we're working on it. There's many things that we can do. The, the, the issue is we have not been invented by consumers. So it starts with the premise that regulators at the end of the 19th century, foremost, bureaucrats invented our industry and said you need to have certain types of insurance. And then we created a very complicated system that we spend explaining to people, and guess what? They don't care. <laughs> yeah? Nobody cares what we do inside. Nobody cares. What they want is when they have an accident, they want to get paid. What is the number one thing that creates this pleasure in the European community for the property family insurance. What's the number one thing? <clears throat> the number one thing is that people think they should get paid for a claim and we don't pay it. Because we have created these very complicated exclusions. Okay. Is that a problem with the lawyers? Are there too many lawyers? No, we have too we have too many of many things. <laughs> so let me give you an example. Uh, in our home market in Germany, until last year, you needed to answer about 26 questions until you got the proper quote to get car insurance. Now, with German, 26 questions, you know, think about what you do when you get on Netflix, you know, in, in about two minutes, you can register your account and then you're there. And that is forming the expectations of consumers. Now, we've moved to 11 questions, yeah, and we're going down. In Italy, I moved, you know, for our uh, motor insurance company, we need two data points, your name and your carpet and we give you with 88% accuracy, we give you a reliable quote. Now we have different claims databases, we have different background data, our claims operation is one of the best in the world, but that is the benchmark. The benchmark is how do we create, and by the way, without losing the analytical engine, without losing the ability to price differentiate, without losing the ability to detect fraud, right? So we're not trying to get rid of all our know-how by being stupid. So simple doesn't mean stupid, it just means be more intuitive for the consumer. And it sounds simple, it's very difficult to do. Steve Jobs has said the saying, you know, doing something really simple is really, really complicated. I, I entirely agree, but I'm still waiting for your example of a simple insurance problem. Buy water insurance from us in Belgium, I think it's still very complicated. Yes, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, the, there is, so that is the fundamental thing. So we can go on, and it is the same true for many other products. And, and we have that in our company. I, I wish I could point out to everybody else. We have to do that in our uh, own company. I had one of my assistants two weeks ago applying for um, a term life product, a little more complicated for various reasons, <coughs> secure a mortgage. It took about an hour and a half, despite a half day preparation, to get the application. It's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. But do you believe that it's partly caused by regulation that uh, all these things get so complicated? So regulation is certainly one part of it, and we're trying to do better. I very much like the point around principles versus rule based, but it's also ourselves. Because of a simple fact, we need a reliable rule of law. The problem is with current populistic politics, but also with all the respect with what supervisors do, retrospective changes to rules. Our legal departments have become, and compliance departments, so paranoid that we are creating these 40 pages that you say you need to read and sign 15 times in order to be damn sure that in the case of a lawsuit by some consumer activists and others, we hold up. And we're trying to do that in order to protect ourselves. And in, in fact, we're creating less trust with society, but because who do you trust when you say, this is a really simple product, here's 40 pages of documentation. It just doesn't work. 
It just doesn't work. But so we could have get help from Gabriel, by the way, and, and others to say the fundamental principle that is the rule of law and the rule of the contracts have to hold up. We cannot have this also now sport in Germany, where 20 years after we wrote a contract, some court says, oh, I read the fine, I actually don't like it. Retrospectively, we change. You can change for the future. We will adjust, but stop going into that. And I think it's a job for society to play. I don't want to blame the courts. I don't want to blame the regulators. We can do a lot ourselves. It's just some advice. That was going to be my question, because it's nice idea the industry wants to have a principle-based regulation. But the end, industry wants regulation to be as a protection against the supervisors. And a supervisor of regulation is a protection against the industry. So how are you going to get out of this mess? And then the supervisor wanted to be protected against politicians. Well, it's not very sad. Yeah, but why don't we? So we come now out of 10 years of chapel regulation. Yeah. Why don't we spend the next few years on getting more clearer and clearer rules on conduct? Yeah. That is what we really have to work on together. And then to say, but we need to rely on these rules also. And we can save a lot of cost in compliance a lot of cost in legal, and consumers can actually get products that they know what they're getting. Yes. But if the rules have to be stable, society depends on the rule of law, and the courts need to be stable, and the, the laws need to be stable. As a former regulator, I can only agree with you. And let's move on to, uh, to conduct and to, uh, to new technologies. Uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, the world is changing, also in a technological way. And my question to you is, where does these technological changes will affect the industry the most? Is it on the products? Is it on the way you do your business? On the underwriting? How do, how do you it's that? everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. But in particular, as we deal and we just discussed with the consumers, when you get outstanding service from Netflix, from Spotify, and here I'm spending more of my time than on movies, and, and, and other things, your expectations for other parts of life dramatically increase in terms of what you expect in terms of ease, in terms of cost to serve, you know, if I have access to billions of songs for nine euros a month, I'm not clear why I'm spending so much money on insurance products. And while I know that two thirds of the cost is distribution that I hardly ever use, and this is not a criticism of any distributor, any part of the value chain, so we will be massively affected, particularly at the customer interface. So we will have everything will change, and the way we're dealing with that at the moment is. Now, you are a big uh, firm and you have all the staff to deal with these technological changes, but don't you think that uh, this will also affect consolidation in the market, that uh, smaller insurers will have more and more difficulties to work in such an environment? I'm not so sure. We always have this debate for like 30, 40, 50 years that the big will win and the small will go away. I don't believe that's the story. The good will win and the good can be small. And we've seen that in industry. It's not the capital or anything, it's, it's innovation and serving clients better. We have amazing mutuals. Many of my benchmarks in the countries are local mutuals that just serve clients better than we do. So I think, don't think it's a form of capital. Just by the way, the rules have to be also fair. Right? We cannot say I don't have cost of capital and I'm writing constantly at a loss, but that's a different issue. <coughs> but the real point is, it's not about large or small, it's about who gives better value to the consumer. And that's not driven by size necessarily. Now, let me give you an example on technology. Allianz used to have a much better IT cost ratio throughout the 80s until the middle 90s. Why? Because it was mainframe based on your scale economies. Then the, the client server world came, and you, don't, you didn't need size. So the lower the cost is uh, in access to technology and, and data, the better it is. Now, the countervailing fact is also clear, particularly in retail business, that is the power of the brand. As you compete in the digital space, you need to bring clients increasingly to you, and that you can only do if you have a proper brand to support for what you do. And that is very important. Therefore, I believe you're right. There will be consolidation naturally over time to the, the brands that can occupy the mind of the consumer. But it's more a, a question for the next decade and two decades than for the next two or three years. And which business line will be affected most by these things? Most of the products that people need to buy, yeah, need to have, so mandatory products can be put in a little go, then Casco, and the most uh, frequency intensive products like health, health supplement, and uh, the, the lower frequency products will come later. If, if I can turn to the way these products are sold on the market, it's very important. You mentioned the intermediation. Uh, it's, it's being said that intermediaries will slowly disappear. 
in the market and people will buy directly from the company. Is that something that you see happening or do you no. see the role? I don't see it that simple. People are always afraid and says, you know, better be the agents are going to go win the role. I don't think so. I don't think so. People do need advice in this world more than ever. Yeah, they need good advice. But when you look at what intermediaries do today, the least amount is actually spent on advice. Most of that is transactional services that, don't, that duplicate what we do. Uh, mostly in the broker space, but also with agents. And we need to focus really on advice. Yes. We need to focus on advice. And do you think that it is realistically possible that, that advice will be, will be given in a direct sale, or do you think that intermediaries are the best channel to give that advice? Uh, it's a choice of the consumer. We have, uh, and it also depends on products. You know, when my son bought his first 25 year old car, and he has no money, everything he sort of computes is the number of cigarette packs because unfortunately he smoked his heroin. Then it matters a lot what the cost of intermediation is, so who buys direct? And but he wants the service and he wants our brand, by the way, that's why our brand and direct is also going to be Allianz. But when you have more, um, how do I say, disposable income, and if, so that's an affordability issue, but you would also need more advice because you're planning for retirement or you're protecting some of the assets that you really care for, the advice intensity goes up. So I, I think it's totally wrong to say, you know, there's direct clients and there is advice-oriented clients. It depends on the situation in life, the complexity of your needs, your propensity to use technology. There are many different drivers, but I don't think advice will go away. Now, we have to get dramatically more efficient, and clients expect us to price these things separately. We always bundle these things and say, you know, pay me X percent of commission regardless of whether I use it or not and whether I'm happy or not, that will go away. Now, if you look at the uh, technological change and the insure techs and uh, the Googles and whatever will come up in the future, do you look at that as a, as a threat uh, or do you think that's a nice combination? Uh, it's a real threat and I'll start with some data on, on Germany and France because we have uneven competition. So I don't mind anybody coming in and whoever is welcome to come, it's called competition, we have a market economy, but we need to have the same rules. And I think politicians, with all due respect, consumers are very naive still around how the economics really work. If you provide all of your data to Google because they scan your contact, they scan everything you do, they put on your camera without you knowing, by the way, wherever you are, then people say, I don't mind that because I can use Google Maps, I can do the search. The reality is they're auctioning your data yeah, in a way that creates much more value to them than it creates for you. Otherwise, you couldn't explain the market. The real answer is that the consumer should be able to capture that value for themselves. First observation. Second observation with some facts. When you uh, do the average of the industry, it's not how Allianz does it, and you bid for cheap auto insurance in Germany through Google, and you compute the cost to acquire a good client via Google, the total cost for the industry on average is about 95 euros. The cost to acquire a client for an average agent in Germany is 75 euros. So what does that mean? It already means that you are losing money if you are acquiring a client to Google because they auction it in such an intelligent way that we give all the value away to the information intermediary and to the people that capture the client value. What does that mean? It's very important. You do not need to be in insurance to capture all our industry profit and take it away. And that we need to regulate. We need, that is what we need to regulate. We cannot say as regulators, oh, I don't see that, and it, it's, it's just completely unfair. And Google, correct, have many friends who said, you guys are stupid. If you're bidding so much money for the people, that's not my problem, it's your problem. Yeah. But you have information asymmetry. By the way, the highest margin that Google makes in the world is in France, and the second highest is in Germany. And more than 30% of the income comes from insurance, actually. And most of that's from water. So we are a massive value driver for the Google market cap. And we need to deal with that. And we need to deal with that quickly. Now, we heard from Andreas that uh, he believes that uh, regulation is ideally being technologically neutral. Yes. But in this area, you know, if we were to ask you, which area should that be regulated <coughs> now as quickly as possible to prevent exactly these abuses to, uh, to come to widespread in the market? So the, again, the question of intermediate, now it's very difficult, and um, just to play a, a little bit of kudos to the European Commission, they always get bashed. 
I can tell you a lot, by the way. Yeah, I don't know, yeah, you have to be a mother she's this year for that. But Margrethe Vestager has done an outstanding job. We participated last year in a, in a, in a conference on a fair competition on, on the, in the platform economy. So the thinking is very much advanced. One of the last Nobel Prize winners, who's uh, from the University of uh, Toulouse, a Frenchman, has already laid out what needs to be done. We need to change regulation. Andrea said it very clearly. Most of our anti, um, how do you say that, anti, uh, well, contact regulation and competition regulation comes from the 60s and 70s that do not affect uh, and reflect platform economics. So they need to be adapted. They also need to be adapted to the world of global regulation. I have to criticize my record for, for example, for the Alstom thing. It doesn't matter what the competition in Europe is, it matters what the competition globally is. Yeah, so we need to really update anti-competition laws. So let me take Amazon. You know, they're very clever because they say, I have only 5% of the detergent market. I have only 5% of this. But they have 50% of your relevant information set for making you making purchasing decisions. So focusing on products that we buy and market share dominance is completely irrelevant as a question economically. They dominate the way you make purchasing decisions on anything. And that is what we need to look at. Yeah, so we have a problem that regulation has to catch up much faster with the realities. It's very funny when the founders of uh, Facebook or Google or come to Europe, there are three business people and there are 50 lawyers. And there are 50 lawyers for a reason, yeah? because they know that we'll catch them. They're trying to just procrastinate as much as we can yeah? that we get to them. So we need to get quicker and then they are not afraid of competition. Yeah? May the best win. So this is not about, I just want to be very clear, that we don't want competition. We just want it to be fair. Yes, yes. I, I think that message should be passed on very clearly to the politicians uh, because the question of whether there should be regulation at the time of change, because when you regulate too soon, maybe you take the wrong uh, regulation. So it's, it's, it's a question of deciding yeah. which, which way to regulate. Maybe, maybe one thing as an economist, that, and so I hope it doesn't sound too theoretical, we don't need to go to the, the, the GAFAs and uh, Heinz and all of that. We can start with intermediation issues today. Let's take the United Kingdom. When politicians ask me always, what does a good industry outcome look like? I always say, okay, ask customer satisfaction. So the first question is, how happy are consumers with what our industry is, is the first. And it's our responsibility to dramatically improve it. The second one is said the economic outcome is, for the same car, let's say car insurance, what are you paying as premium, and what is the net payout to the consumer? What is the net payout to the consumer? Unfortunately, if you correlate that to regulatory intensity, it's one of the highest in the United Kingdom, the payouts are the lowest. So I'm not saying regulators are bad. I'm just saying you know, regulatory intensity is not usually a good question for whether you get a good outcome for the consumer. Remember, mandatory renewal, you know, everybody goes, you have 40% of the market churning, and everybody pays for that. So the net, when you take 100%, you know, 100 pounds is premium, what is the net payout? In the UK, it's one of the lowest in Europe because you have the highest level of intermediation on anything, including selling things. So the second thing you should ask as a politician that wants fair competition, how do you increase net benefits to consumers? It's not so complicated. Okay. So politicians should be thinking more like consumers themselves. That is a great way to put it. Yes, yes. Well, let's, let's continue now a little bit about the role of insurance in the future. Uh, with these technological changes, uh, the data availability, uh, would you agree with a statement that, that would say that uh, insurers in the future are going to work more on prevention? It's going to be, the insurer is my friend, he or she knows what I need and will take care of me, rather than the company that interferes to uh, pay out my, my damages. Yeah, it's not just prevention. I think the whole question around services, just to replace it, will play a much bigger role in the future and in information provision than it has in the, in the past. Yeah, really dealing with damages is just too little. Yeah, and, we, yeah, and it's, it underestimates our ability to reflect outcomes. We have very obvious ones in just getting really better advice. But I'll take one thing in, in car insurance that we are doing already, and it's going to come. It's very interesting to find out that the uh, automotive companies do not have any control, in difference to what I thought, on the distribution of their cars really. So when you ask the CEO of the big brands and says, can you really ensure proper service in your dealerships for damaged cars? The answer is yes, but the fact is no. 
And there's many, many reasons. In some countries, they can't even control the distribution of their cars. They can't, by law, regulation doesn't allow them to have their own branches. So when you go to, uh, and you have an accident, and you ask, so number one, who takes care of the fact that I need quickly get access to a good garage? Then you would say that's obvious with what we do today. It is not obvious. Second, do we know that the car is getting technically proper repair? i.e., is the car, after the repair, in the great the same shape, adjusted for the, for the accident that it was before, maybe not losing a lot of residual value? Nobody knows. Three, is the cost of the repair economically fair? Nobody knows. So when you think about cost of ownership, again, thinking like a consumer, you have no idea. And we know today that in Europe, the car manufacturers don't make money with selling cars. They make all the money without the sales, which means that inflation for spare parts has been going up three, four times real inflation. And consumers believe in some conspiracy with the insurance. I don't know. I haven't thought about that yet. <laughs> but so think about what we do in the future. There is an accident, and we give a guarantee to say, we'll get you proper repair fast. You will love the experience. We'll make sure the technical quality of the repair is outstanding. So if you are a leasing company that actually owns the car or a consumer, Allianz makes sure that the value doesn't decrease. And we give customer feedback to the OEMs because they never really get it. We'll have the data, not out of text or somebody else. Will a bot do all these things? No. no. Will there be human Technology space? will help us to do that. I think the key thing, how we think about technology, it's an enabler. Now, if you want to talk to a bot, why not if that's fast? And, you know, I'll tell you a funny an experience I had in the early 90s. I was living in the university with other people and says, why do you always call this voice response computer? And my uh, fellow student says, because I don't want to talk to a human. I don't want to talk to a human. Because my account is in deficit, I don't want to be told that I'm in overdraft by a human being. I'd rather want to be told by a computer. So kidding aside, there are services where you're very happy to get an electronic response. But we are always contrasting this picture around there's robots and everybody will be treated by robots. I think that's wrong. Yeah. Technology should help us to make better decisions and support us in things where we can gain productivity. And in our industry, the productivity gains that are possible are gigantic. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, let me go then a little bit on a different topic, and that's the, it was mentioned also by Andres, this long-term vision of the insurance industry. Um, I, I noticed that uh, long-term guarantees are being cut down by many insurers. They move on to the link business. Uh, if there are not going to be long-term liabilities, there will be no long-term investments. Do you believe that the industry has <coughs> too much a short-term view in the way it operates? We don't believe the future is in future conflict. We actually believe the, the future is in very carefully managed longer-term guarantees, but they have to be economically produced. In a world where we have financial suppression, like the repression that we have in Germany today, you know, just be very clear, there is no reason for interest rates being negative in, in Germany, other it's in the interest of the state and the politicians. There's no economic reason. You know, whatever Mr. Draghi says, it's just not true. Well, the state it has. Yeah, the state but, yeah, well, the state is not true, <coughs> because we don't have the same interest as people that have a lot of debt. The issue is we're trying to get out of debt by reducing the cost of debt. In the history of mankind, it has never worked. I thought it was just done for the bankers. No, they, the banks uh, in the long term also do not benefit from that. They benefit from certain spreads, particularly the South, from smaller spreads. But that only thing that works if you get rid of the debt. You see that in the case of Italy, the spreads are back to 280 basis points. So that hasn't really helped. Now, the issue is we have financial repression, which is everybody that is in debt, that's to be states and rich people have a benefit, and the poor people that do not have access to loans. So it's the most unfair treatment of badly poor people that we can have. So all the narrative, we're doing it for the poor and social service, we can know what is just poor, baloney, sorry. Uh, so just to get the facts right. And in this environment, you cannot offer guarantees that require a positive return. So it's not because the industry doesn't want to do it. In financial repression, it's very difficult to do. Now, it's not impossible as long as you have cash flow matching assets. 
the key change, and I, by the way, wanted to be, take the opportunity to thank you for your life's work on solvency too. We always criticize it. But the one thing you've done really well, and I would really like to respect Carl, is giving decade-long interest rate guarantees that you cannot cash flow match is a crime. And you've helped to overcome that crime and take the risk out of this uh, industry, so I thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Um, no, I really mean, no, I really mean it, because it shouldn't happen. Now, where we have assets to match the long-term liability is that we want to give, because that's our value proposition. Our value proposition is not to sell expensively wrapped funds. That is not the future. We need to add more value, and that is risk transfer. So we need to do that. But it has to be cash flow match, for which we do need the assets, and we do need economic returns for it. So that's why Allianz, for example, on its 800 billion insurance reserve, moved basically from 40 billion alternative assets to 140 billion in all five years. Because we can afford, as an industry, to pocket the illiquidity reserves and to manage that carefully and share that with the policy. That is what we have to do in, in these times. And it's not going, you know, putting more money into the equity. So it's good to see that uh, you have this lo long-term vision about uh, the need for guarantees, and I think uh, obviously uh, the way things are moving, that people put the risks on private individuals, I think it's a little bit unfair, because many people cannot manage that. But can you give some examples? Sorry, it's a regulation again. I went to university in the United States, and in 1986 and 1987, it started with the so-called ERISA program, took the tax benefits away and moved them to unit, uh, to unit link and funds, because the argument was you get a much better return if you only invest in equities over time. The unfortunate thing is a former trader, I can say that, over 30 years, it was 40 trading days that determined all the positive outcomes for the equity market, 40 days. If you were not invested during those 40 days, you didn't get the returns. So we want to make this asset manager. You need both, you need the accumulation, but you do need the capital protection. And the poorer you are, the more protection you need. You can help educate politicians to say taking the guarantees out is something that is only beneficial to the provider of the pension, is not beneficial to the consumer. I think it's a very important message to pass in here. Uh, but I would like to hear from you in this debate about sustainability. Uh, there is this word for advice that the Commission has launched to the European Supervisory Authorities to identify issues where the industry may be too short term. Maybe caused by regulation, but that, that may be also other things that are not caused by regulation. But how can the insurance industry help to overcome this short termism, which clearly is not in the interest of sustainability? And that's a very difficult one. It's a very difficult. First, and, and go back to what Andrea said, we are one of the most important uh, groups of investors in the world. As asset owners, or at least representative asset um, fiduciaries for our policyholders, we have an influence who we give money to in the asset management world. And like Allianz, many of us give the money to third parties. And when we give the mandates, we have both the right and the obligation to steer the mandates. And if the mandate is only give me X return, and I don't care how you do it, we shouldn't be surprised that people make their money with speculation. So start with that, and again, regulation can help us with that. Because, you know, in difference, I get a lot of letters from very interesting American people that you need to improve this and you need to improve that, and I always write back, are you applying the same rules to yourself, by the way? And I never get an answer. A small detail, right? So let's call the bluff. But the second thing is, we do have an, an, an ability to uh, put sustainability criteria into our investments, and that would drive asset management behavior differently. Yeah, whether that is, uh, that is very important. But I want to go back to the point that you made. The way we set accounting rules in the last 25 years has been driving ever more short-term orientation because with the so-called mark-to-market accounting, which by the way for solvency is very important we should do, there is a differentiation what you move through equity and solvency capital versus what you move through earnings. And the more we have investment bankers, sorry, paying accounting regulators to drive us into derivatives because they want the volatility in the earnings, so we need to spend the money on hedging it with derivatives, the more you will get people out of volatile assets. Yeah? And, and drive volatility. And I think we need to understand half of the investment banking industry was paid on volatility. So you don't care whether prices go up or down. You don't care, as long as they move. 
So if all the, most, the smartest people in the world are paid for creating volatility, guess what happens? Well, yes. Yeah, so we need to think a little bit more deeply and then say how do we set accounting rules, how do we set capital rules. So that was always said, you know, the equity question now with the IFRS, move the volatility through OCI, I need to regulate, sorry for getting capital, show it and show it in the capital requirements, but don't move it through the earnings. Yeah, allow us to sort of think through how, how you do that without creating artificial earnings. The worst part is what I call profit as inception where you say, I have an economic profit that is a component on 20 years and I show it on day one. By the way, then I get a bonus on that. If the money doesn't come, I get fired, great, but I've accumulated five years of super stock options and then I go home. And the loss is with the shareholder and the profit is with me. It's called Wall Street. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah but guys, let's get a little smarter here. Yeah, but this is, you know, there's not many people that can say, I can say also, the basis of everything is a Yeah. So, if I ask a question, I'm, I'm happy to give the, the problem is how do we get from this conversation to impact? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and uh, I think this industry needs to really work together, and I said it too. If we have a cacophony of different opinions and uh, how to get her, because the bank has a lot more money than us for lobbying. Are so, we sure? need to really spend sure? more time. Yeah, are you sure about that? Oh, much more. Okay. Yeah, I can show you the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and you see it at the Brussels restaurants. <laughs> I can tell you that I had a uh, I had a commissioner who once said uh, that uh, he always thought that the bank is one of the biggest lobbyists, but uh, he learned that each of us is uh, equally. Uh, really? Yes, he did say. Yeah. I, I won't tell you which commissioner it was, but no, that's not too. Uh, tell you because you probably get twenty different meetings with insurers, so that's why I thought because there are so many of you. Well, that's exactly I think the point. Why don't we have two and we spend our time making sure that we get a clear message? And you know why we need the twenty meetings? No. Two, twenty meetings. Because these shows are also always too complicated. So you need the second meeting to understand. Hey, we'll we'll first meeting. Meeting. Yes, <laughs> anyway. well, let's move on a little bit to uh, the uh, human resources side yeah. of the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, with all these technological changes, and I was you know, 142,000 people, uh, how are you building this company for the future with all these changes? Uh, how do you manage to get your staff to? Follow that uh, approach, and, and as a leader, so, managers, uh, what are the sort of characteristics that you would see the ideal staff, the ideal managers in an insurance company for the future? For me, that's the most challenging, also personally most challenging piece. If I you know I just signed up for another six years in Alliance, and I have to tell you after the first 11, where I have personally to do much better is that on the point of humanity, right? So when you start, when I started, we had two big problems. I would call it the heart attack and the cancer problem. The heart attack problem was called PIMCO. We have uh, one of the largest investment managers in the world. And they were losing from the departure of the founder about $10 billion a week at the time. So I said, you know, if that continues, I'm out of a job at some point. Because they cumulatively lost $350 billion US dollars in the flows. Now, that was 2015. 2017, two years later, we had 170 billion inflows, the strongest year of inflows since the inception of the firm. Right? So we've been very good in addressing that. We brought in completely new leadership. The second, the cancer problem was life insurance. No? The thing that we've discussed earlier, we have fundamentally changed uh, not just the new business, but also worked on the back book of Allianz, and I think now we have one of the best balance sheets in the industry. But it took five years of very hard work. Through that time, I was so focused on making sure we become resilient that you become very edgy, yeah, and you become very, very determined. And then we, we have an organization that is very consensual uh, and driven, very decentralized. And people were a little bit, you know, not so happy about the leadership style. I still defend it as absolutely necessary because it was, but that is the self defense. Going forward, I think it is very important to spend more time with our people to explain to them that we are not driving change just to increase dividend per share, but we need to really tighten the ropes and make the ship ready for the next storm that is around the corner. And then people say, yeah, but what the heck, you know, you have the high, you have now 90 billion market cap, you're by far the biggest, you beat all the competition, you know, what are you worried about? We're great. And they just don't understand that it's not anymore the stable carpet that we're standing on. You know, somebody, quite a few people, are trying to weigh, uh, taking it away. And the real issue we have is the the average age is increasing in the company. It's now 47 years. 
So a lot of people think about, you know, I just have to make it for the next 10 years, and then, you know, whatever happened after me, as long as my pension is fine, so I'm looking, looking at the rating. It won't be fine. It won't be fine. Yeah, but it, it won't be fine for somebody else. Yeah, it won't be fine. Yeah, so getting that thing right uh, is going to be a key challenge, and for that, we actually need different people to it's also a very difficult message. It's part of retraining, and we need to spend a lot of time and energy on retraining people, bringing them new skills. The first one is actually understanding what do our consumers really want and need, and how they want it, rather than what the intermediaries tell us that what they want, which is typically how we've been thinking the last 129 years. And then the second one is learning technology. By the way, not just learning how technology works, but what the economics of technology look like. It doesn't help you that you understand what each MTL means. It also needs to know, you know, when you buy technology, how does it affect your business model, and how does it affect the economics of the business model? Isn't that also an aspect of sustainability? The way we deal with people isn't it so that we ask too much sometimes of, of the staff. Do we ask too much of the staff? Well, we are asking a lot relative to the past. It's true. And I don't want to be a cynic, um, but I think... You don't know for that, by the way. Yeah, but it's also very comfortable in our industry. You know, we've been attracting people that did come to us because we are a stable industry, right? So we had, and I don't mean it in a negative way, a little bit of adverse selection when it gets to agility. Yeah? Because when you're really agile, would you want to work in insurance, historically? Maybe in distribution and custom interface. So we need to deal with the fact of who we have. We have great people in our industry. But we really need to teach the elephant to dance, and that's not so easy. No. Well, but the, the fact is also that, particularly in the age group between 20 and 30, we see a lot of young people having burnouts you know, uh, in the financial sector industry. Uh, do you also have that problem? No. no. So everybody's happy about the other No, I wouldn't say that. But, but again, so the, the number one thing, the first thing that people ask for what they're missing is actually why are we doing all of this? Exactly. Yeah, we have we call that purpose or mission. Yes. But it's really funny that after 129 years, we spend a lot of time the last two years of what are we actually trying to achieve. And we spend a lot of time with thousands of employees around what is that. And we have something very simple. We call that now, we secure your future, which is, by the way, your future, not our future. Because we were very much internally focused, you know, very proud of ourselves. But it was always Allianz, Allianz, Allianz. And the, the purpose is we serve somebody else. So your job, and the question, the answer to your question is, and I ask every employee, write it down, what are you doing to secure the future of our clients? Whether you're in clients or legal, if you cannot answer the question, better answer. The sex of get outward orientation consistent with what we said earlier. So the, the people are looking for meaning, particularly the young ones. And the second one, they're sick and tired of nonsense. We just talked about the fact that we are very complicated. Complexity creates lots of errors yeah, and a lot of futile activities, so people don't want to do stupid things, even if they get paid well. Right? It's not just, oh, I'm making 50000 I have a great job, but I'm doing nonsense. I'm finding out of six months, I'm just correcting errors that shouldn't happen in the first place. That creates burnout. And then the third one, I'll be overstretching them because we're asking them to manage a very complex legacy and building the future. Help me understand as a person how that works. Yeah, so I, I, I really have an issue. And then we have to be a little bit fair. It's very comfortable. I always think about my kids. They always criticize. They always say, you know, I have the right to do this. And I always say, do you also have an obligation? How, we, how about a year of social service? How about learning something before you bossing other people around? So we have also, in some of the more fat society, a little bit of an attitude issue. But I don't want to have that on the first page. So if you bring it back to <laughs> now, yeah, when we hire people from Romania, just to give you an example, we bring them to Munich, they say, this is paradise. Yes. And when you ask locals, says, I'm entitled to this. And you know, I think we need to think a little bit about what is this entitlement really mean. Well, it brings it back to your account. You the balance sheet does not only have assets, but also liabilities. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> To finalize, and then I'll go to some of the questions from the audience, is uh, the ideal insurer for the future. How, how would you see that? Which is the insurer that you believe, at this stage, will survive all the challenges that we have talked about? It's called Allianz, of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> no, but King aside, King aside, some tough so but let's not have Uber's dominated the debate. Again, I think the key question is, 
going back to the question for our communities. If the people say we love this company because it does a great service and we are happy with what it does, the likelihood that we do well is the highest. I think that's a very good summary and we will not go further into the details here. Uh, I have a question here about uh, insurance gap, cyber, net gap pensions. What do you think should be done to address these, these gaps? There was net gap, pension, cyber. Yeah. Let's start with cyber. Yes. 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 There's a difference in my mind whether we protect the consumer, the end consumer, or we protect large businesses. My personal opinion is very difficult to ensure, if not impossible, large corporates because we do not know how to price the risk. Because we don't know the risk. And what we're doing at the moment is gambling. Now, we often do that when we don't know an industry and then we, we find out over time. It's a pretty dangerous gamble because of the agglomeration risk that was described earlier. And you already see that today, a lot of uh, cyber risk is in business interruption coverages already entailed. So we have had that risk for a long time. And when you look at the medium to large cyber risk frequency over the last few years, it has gone up massively because we did not understand properly the value chains. And we haven't done a great job as an industry, including the brokers, to really model these business changes. And then you will see that very soon with the China-US conflict, as supply chains get rearranged, there will be a lot of disruption and a lot of claims coming. So I think we really need to study the interdependencies and what. Cyber is just an amplifier because you move from physical flows to virtual flows, so if they happen instantly, and they're more difficult to model because <coughs> you do not know the connections. So the point of Andreas on having the now, the problem is with we need the data history, this is how we do tariffs, it's unfortunately not working. So fast as tariff science, why does it work? Not work. 90% of the data we have in this moment was created the last two years. So if you say I need 10 years of data, unfortunately it's completely irrelevant because most of the data that matters is created as we speak. So we also need totally different pricing mechanisms for these things, and we are just at the beginning. Now, I don't want to be gloomy, it's a huge opportunity, but the way we do it today, in my opinion, doesn't work. It's totally different from protecting the consumer. We can do a much better job to think about how do we protect our mobile phones, how do we restore the data, how do we ring fence that, because that's an SME, it's much easier to do than to do it for a large international component. So we're actually also, I think, as an industry, completely working on the wrong thing. So my prediction is we need for the industry self-insurance solutions, that need to be intelligent structures and get the data um, in, in a way that we start to price them over the next decade. But we can do a lot to protect the consumers and the small businesses. And we have a big gap there. Do you think that an insurance company should have insurance against cyber risk? We do have that. Yeah, you do have it, but uh, you may not be the... Uh... I don't want to give recommendations for other people. That's what I want to say. <laughs> No, but the, the reason I've asked that question is, of course, that uh, it's a question of designing new product and knowing how to operate with that. The regulation can help you by requiring that in short, so that you have the life. Yeah, but Carl, uh, then you need to know how the price things thing. If, if you say, you know, you need to have it, but you don't know what to do, then we end up with what we do on nuclear, where we have these Maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's the answer, but we need to know how to price it. Yes. And at the moment, I think we are. Dances in the dark, I think, is this song from me. I uh, hear the famous question. Uh, oh, well, pension and net cap. Yes, you So I net cap, should go on pension. Yeah. Net cap we can do very quickly. Net cap we can do very it's, it's very well known. It's very well modeled. It's very well documented. And we still lose our shirts. Why? Why? Because human beings, because we're optimists, we, we do not price tail risks. So I have a debate with our actuaries around, can this happen once in 250 years, or one in 2,000 years, or whatever, and I say, I don't care, I want to know what the limit is, and I don't want to use more than X. And then they say, yeah, but if you do that, we don't get the right price for it. And so that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Give it to somebody who's stupid enough to take it at this price. And there is plenty of capital that is ready to take net cap risk at the lower price. Now, because we are steered by the capital markets on absolute earnings, People are ready to gamble. People are ready to gamble. So the key thing we have done, and when you think about 16 and 17, we had dramatically less net cap than anybody else, just because we decided we do not give absolute earnings targets for these people. It's really return on the risk 
that you expose, and it's not one standard deviation value at risk nonsense. It is how much can I lose, and do I like the trade? Do I like the trade? Yeah, and having been a trader, you get a little bit of a different view. But we do really misprice. Now, why do I say that? It's a big problem because if capital suddenly disappears, we may end up with capital shortages. So if I was a regulator, I would not like it. And the first thing I would ask for is create an IBNR for that cat exposure. Do not allow this industry as we do it today based on current cash flows. So we know uh, European windstorm is the biggest risk for us in Europe. Require the build up of an IBNR. And then you get totally different pricing and much better speed. And pensions. Pensions. So what's the third one? Uh, no. How much time do you have? No, you're still so young, so it's not a problem for you. Oh, that's yeah. saying that it's, it's, uh, it's a big gap. Um, yeah, a big gap, yeah. Uh, the issue is almost unresolvable uh, from a policy standpoint because the people that have to put in different rules have zero incentive to do so. This is the The enlightened politician is a little bit of an oxymoron these days. So the, the, the question is, what do we do? because we have been promising benefits to consumers that we know we can get. So the German pension benefit that per annum is now a third of the public budget, 100 billion euros, right? So they call that the, the input to the pension fund, which means the public pension system is bust unless we get 100 billion taxes in. And it only works because Germany comes out of 15 years of a massive economic boom, right? We have full employment and so on. And by the way, artificially depressed interest rates, so that service is artificially low. And supplementary. Budget. And all kinds of stuff. So the issue is, if you do not find a solution that people stop promising stuff that they cannot prove they can honor, it starts with accounting. You have to fund pension obligations. You cannot yes. offer something that says the taxpayer is going to fund that. Unfortunately, I think we will not get out of this trap without a lot of pain. Now, we can. Uh, I think the best way to do that is the most efficient way is through workplace marketing because it has dramatically lower distribution cost. So the German, the Trippi Hades Bordeaux, I think is one of the best systems in the world. Uh, whether it's fund-based or insurance-based, it doesn't matter, but it's the most efficient way to deal with that. However, we have an ever larger share of people that are in changing employment. So it cannot be something for large companies. We need to find a solution for SMEs too. So, yeah. but, so we're working on it, we need to educate people, but unfortunately I think the incentives are rigged against the poor people. Let's, let's maybe have a last question and then uh, we'll stop for the coffee break. Uh, there is a question that... Uh, um, uh, I would like that question. about uh, <laughs> the simplicity of the products yeah. and all the complexity of GDPR and things like that. Is it still possible to use an insurance product that is simple? All the environmental... Yeah, products. it gets more and more difficult, but I think we should not use regulation as an excuse. I gave you the example of 26 to 11, and we can probably go to 5. Yeah, it's not going to be too like it is, but there is dramatic simplification possible. Even in this case that I said, you know, on the documentation. So then I'll close with an example. I was buying from a Canadian hi-fi company called Bose. You may know them. So earplugs. And they have an extended warranty uh, insurance uh, business product. And it's very funny because when you unpack it, it has two pieces. It has, you know, a small leaflet with fine print where at least I need different glasses. And then there's a page on front from Bose that says, Dear customer, we have insurance for your product. Because it's so complicated, we just tell you what is in this leaflet. And it says, here are the five things that when they happen to your policy or to your product, we will pay for. And by the way, here are the five things we will not pay for. Your boss company, and by the way, if you're interested in the detail, read the leaflet. But I will do it. Yes, okay. Now, they didn't say I will do it, but you know, this is what it basically says. So we have a lot that we can do. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, you all agree with me that uh, when I qualified uh, Oliver as a man for all season, I would say he's also a man for answers to any question that, you, uh, that you're being asked, sir. Uh, I think that you stressed a number of very important things. 
Uh, first of all, that we have a lot of challenges, but there are solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think you proved the point that you're not this. Uh, you stress the role of accounting. And you know, this is dear to my heart because uh, a lot of problems uh, are related back to that. But you also, and I think that's very important for you, uh, I think that you also uh, uh, express uh, the importance of the human aspect in everything. I think it's very, very, very important. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Oliver for his excellent. <laughs>